Great, thank you. Oh, we have Jerry, okay. Um, <clears throat> hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, today we have a, a very exciting talk, at least to me, by uh, Professor Jamie Hansen, uh, who is an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh uh, Department of Psychology. His uh, research focuses on neural security neural circuitry, children and adolescents use to learn about different aspects of their environment and how such circuits are shaped by early life stress and why neural changes due to the stress confer risks for negative outcomes. You see, it's very important uh, line of research. And within this uh, direction, he had some I guess excursions <laughs> in uh, MRI methodology and papers on tensor-based morphometry and automated amygdala segmentations and related topics. Um, so I, yes, I've been interacting with Jamie for the last couple of years and uh, very fascinating work. And he, I actually very much like it that he cares uh, a lot about uh, quality and um, MRI quality and took on these projects to try to see if quality actually affects the um, morphometric features at the end of the pipeline. So um, without further ado, um, Jamie Hansen, thanks for joining us. Go ahead. All right, let me see. I'll just get started. Can folks see that? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so uh, Pradeep, thank you for the kind introduction and the invitation. Um, I'm really excited to talk with the group and share some of this work that we've been doing. Um, so uh, as Pradeep said, my name's uh, Jamie, I'm at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm in the Department of Psychology and a learning scientist at the Learning Research and Development Center. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about this uh, recent paper that was um, published in Brain Informatics um, this year. Um, and the title of my talk is broadly how I learned to continually worry and think too much about structural MRI quality. Um, I uh, am a, a father of a, of a three year old toddler and so I will make a lot of bad dad jokes and a few allusions to internet memes. Um, but just as a um, kind of note of context. Uh, uh, MRI methodologically focused work is not really my primary research interest. My, my real kind of bread and butter work is focused on developmental adversity and how that may connect to brain development. And so I, I've researched and worked with a lot of populations that have had incredibly difficult life experiences from um, uh, abuse and neglect, different forms of child maltreatment, incredibly high amounts of life stress. And that work is really kind of initially focused a lot on um, structural kind of variations related to this adversity and how it may kind of connect to different kinds of negative developmental outcomes, from cognition to mental health. Um, it's used uh, tensor-based morphometry and a lot of things from the ANTS pixel group at Penn, um, done some EBM. Um, but uh, as a graduate student, I was um, really fortunate to connect with a lot of scholars who are really sophisticated methodologists. Um, Rasmus Byrne, who I think is speaking in this series uh, later in the year, was on my dissertation committee. Mu Chung was a really good colleague, James G, um, and other folks. And, um, you know, through some of those kind of formative training experiences um, and some other things, you know, uh, other kinds of uh, moments in graduate school and postdoctoral um, training, um, I, I became uh, really kind of acquainted with and, and critical fMRI uh, and MRI methodological developments were really fairly salient to me. Most folks may know this kind of, uh, I think now classic paper by Jonathan Power um, kind of showing, you know, the, the basics of uh, frame-wise frame displacement um, uh, was related to, being related to um, resting state um, connectivity metrics. Um, interestingly, I actually went to a, like a brain summer camp when this paper was kind of coming out and, and Jonathan was a bit of a, a, a kind of cause celeb at that moment because he found this really kind of uh, rich relationship between motion um, and potential biases in functional connectivity. Um, and this was true for even really small kind of, we used to call them micro movements. Um, and, you know, predicating or kind of predicated by those two things, I had a kind of really just 
pretty simple and straightforward idea. I had done all this structural imaging work. There was all this kind of nice work by Jonathan Power and others about the impacts of motion. And I said, oh, what, you know, has anyone really looked at it or thought about motion and uh, its impact with a structural MRI? Um, and I was very mindful of, you know, were the, the differences I was actually seeing truly, uh, you know, biomarkers, trait-like things, or, or might they be, you know, spurious, noisy, biased in, in their regard, in some regard. Um, and, you know, I had this, you know, great stroke of insight, you know, and I was like, oh, this is a great idea, you know, but it had already kind of been done. Uh, it had been fairly charted, you know, ground um, with greater motion typically kind of relating to lower image contrast between gray and white matter, um, reduced estimates of gray matter volume and, and thickness, um, and many times inflated effect size estimates for volume and variables of interest or some any kind of morphometric output and variables of interest, age, clinical grouping, things like that. And there's a kind of a um, couple exemplar papers um, from folks at um, MGH and the NIH and other places kind of finding um, you know, that uh, motion and, and morphometry um, are sometimes inter interconnected. The challenge was that, or one limitation is, uh, many of these studies didn't really measure anything about a T1. They used some kind of proxy. They used DVARs or frame-to-frame -frame, you know, displacement from an fMRI scan within the same scanning session, and darned if they ever got anywhere near a T1, except just to kind of uh, you know, put it into FreeSurf or do VBM with it or something like that. Um, this, isn't true, this isn't true of every study, but you know, the preponderance of them use some kind of proxy often from a task or resting-based uh, fMRI scan. One really notable exception in a paper I kind of like love dearly um, by Rosen and colleagues at UPenn that appeared in your image in, in 2018, um, you know, did a, a couple of, of, of notable things and really focused pretty deeply and robustly on quality. They first found that highly trained manual raters could achieve decent concordance, pretty good concordance. They also found, like a lot of other studies, that the quality ratings varied by age. So noisier scans um, often related to, um, of, often were seen in, in younger participants. Um, and they um, also leveraged FreeSurfer, an actual, some kind of metric of a T1, and found that Euler number um, actually identified um, uh, unusable images. So they had raters um, identify usable and unusable images. And then they found that free surfers Euler number could successfully kind of identify, um, you know, which images were usable. And most folks probably know this, but Euler number is just this kind of uh, summary measure of topological complexity from a reconstructed cortical surface. It's the sum of the vertex and faces subtracted by the numbers of faces. And, and what this, these graphs are basically showing in some training and test sets um, on the horizontal axis are different metrics of image quality, SNR, white matter, histogram skewness. And um, uh, on the vertical axis is area under the curve um, for this for just kind of a logistic model. Um, and what you can kind of see across these training and test sets is um, Euler number kind of does a, a, pretty, a pretty solid and, and superior job at predicting scan inclusion. And so that's just kind of a notable kind of interesting point. The, the particularly, I think, powerful thing that really underscores some limitations and gaps um, with some of the past work, um, Rosen and colleagues found that motion um, varied um, across the scanning session. So this graph is a root mean square realignment estimate. So basically kind of just a, a broad proxy of how much you have to realign a functional scan, whether it's a perfusion scan or some kind of task or a resting state scan. Um, and so that kind of argued that uh, there's variability across the scanning session. Um, interestingly, and related to kind of thinking about a lot of applied questions, um, individuals with lower quality T1s also had differential um, attrition over the course of a scanning session. So um, what this graph uh, pa panel B shows is individuals who had poor scans um, as rated by lower numbers, zero here. Um, uh, these are uh, visual human ratings. Um, and two is it indicative of a better scan, um, found that basically individuals had, who had good T1s, um, really good T1s, were more likely to complete 
uh, you know, all the way through a scanning session versus um, someone who had kind of poor T1 quality, um, more likely to drop out, stop a scan. So you can think about, depending on the sequencing of scans, um, you may not even get a resting state or a task-based uh, estimate because a subject may abort a scanning session. So if you're really trying to figure out, especially in big data sets, whether scans are usable, using these proxies may not always be possible and feasible. And the last kind of interesting um, thing was, um, you know, these proxy measures from task and resting state data also are not as good as when you actually work with a T1. So this is just, again, an AUC curve um, figure with um, some, you know, measures from a, a T1 versus a task and resting state. Uh, and it, you know, Rosen was kind of finding that there's this pretty strong association with the Euler number um, and uh, the likelihood of a scan being included. Um, and then kind of similar to past work, they kind of find that these, you know, estimates of data quality were related to cortical thickness. Um, and this is, sorry. yep. Can I interrupt you again? Sure. Yeah, sorry. Can you go back to that last uh, uh -huh. panel? The very last one, yeah. Um, what's happening here, the uh, panel C? See, and so basically this is a um, comparison uh, of logistical models and AUC curves for different kinds of metrics uh, of image quality or motion in some form. And so basically um, AUC is on the, the vertical and on no, the horizontal. Um, yeah. Where is the AUC coming from? What are they predicting? So they're predicting scan inclusion exclusion as determined by a human rater. Ah, uh, okay. And using, you can almost think about this as trying to automate the process a bit. And so can we throw in, um, you know, if your uh, DV is uh, zero one, you know, in a logistic model of inclusion or exclusion, um, can we use as an IV um, you know, Euler number from this free server reconstruction or motion estimates from uh, an ASL perfusion scan, task based or resting state um, data. Oh, so okay. basically, does that make sense? Yeah, basically, uh, predicting quality is does it have acceptable quality or not, right? Which is what you mean by inclusion exclusion. Yeah, but they actually, so they have uh, binaryized the data. So they basically, yeah. a lot of times they're using the scan, the human rater checks, aggregating across them, and then saying, you know, making yeah. it a zero or one, and then saying, mm -hmm. can we predict that zero or one based on Euler, a T1 metric, or something else, some other motion proxy estimate from um, the other scans? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... Um... I, what, what do you call entirely explanatory because free software would fail on bad scans, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you can think about um, within free surfer, there's still the Euler number is a continuous metric. Um, so you can have a lot of uh, a high number, a high Euler number, or a low Euler number, and, and it's just a continuous metric. So um, they were kind of arguing that Euler number. Um, is both a, a metric of image quality because um, it's basically the number of holes that happen in the surface mesh. And so the more kind of holes that happen and you have to fill, that's a higher Euler number in FreeSurfer. And then that higher Euler number would be, and, and more topological holes probably happen for poor quality scans. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I would not call it the quality metric, but I, it could be a quality indicator in yes. a way. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So yeah. I have a, a really bad set of memes partially about that, um, where basically on some level, I, I, I love this paper. I think it's really powerful and rigorous and, and fairly robust science where, you know, they, they've rated They've had human raters look at 1800 scans. They have, you know, they talk about um, anchoring points. They really are kind of trying to go through a, a great deal of rigor in terms of even just developing um, a protocol. Um, they compare multiple metrics of image quality and noise from task and resting state data and these um, free surfer metrics. Um, and they even provide, you know, and kind of, you know, I think rich. Uh, data that says these functional scans are, are good, but if you actually go to the structural scans and have some direct, more direct measure from a structural scan, 
um, you can tell about image quality, scan inclusion, um, and these kind of um, critical questions in, in, in a bit of a more um, a stronger way. Um, but related a bit to what your comments were underlying, uh, there's a couple different things. So first, I don't want to run FreeSurfer on every scan just to get a quality metric. Most folks, again, probably know this, but FreeSurfer is, you know, sometimes on the order of 20 hours. You can parallelize it. There's lots of other sites you can go into. But like, for many of us, it's going to take like 10, 15 hours. You may have to restart FreeSurfer, da 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 and you know, as, as, as projects start to scale, this just becomes somewhat computationally infeasible. Um, and you may also just be wasting a ton of just hours um, of computational time um, with bad data. Why put in a, a, you know, just a completely garbage set of scans and waste hundreds of hours um, when you know, that not, may not be feasible for all of us? Um, the other thing that I think Pradeep was getting at is, a metric derived from FreeSurfer, um, and this is some of the risen results, um, a metric derived from FreeSurfer is related to a morphometric measure for, that's also from FreeSurfer. Uh, in this case, um, Rosen found a lot of kind of connections with cortical thickness. And so basically, I kind of always just had the moment or just kind of feeling of like, well, is it really motion and quality or might there just be some algorithmic error? There's kind of this circularity of what's happening where, um, you know, uh, a marker of free surfer not performing well, this Euler number, uh, relates to, you know, a variation in free surfer output. Um, some of that, you know, just really felt like there's this, this problem of, of circularity. So motivated by a lot of these kind of pieces, you know, um, I wanted to try to think about, can we start to have metrics of image quality that were quicker to derive that similarly predicted scan inclusion? I put an asterisk there and I've kind of come back to uh, making scan decisions, inclusion criteria, and kind of that definitional piece, definitional piece right at the end um, of the talk, because I think that's a, a big, um, I know, I think a kind of critical issue, something that I think that's also kind of um, central to Pradeep's uh, heart. And uh, we sometimes maybe gloss over and just say, oh, scan inclusion and exclusion. And I think we have to be a little bit more nuanced about that, but we'll put a pin in there. Um, and I'll talk about that right at the end a little bit more. Um, the other thing was, you know, would these kind of potential quality metrics that were easy to kind of get, would, would they relate to sociodemographic factors? Folks have found age associations, sometimes BMI associations, you can think bigger people um, in a scanner, maybe less comfortable, more likely to move. Um, clinical diagnosis, again, I do a lot of applied work and I keep kind of wondering whether some of the data and results that are, that are kind of coming out of, of applied, especially psychiatry spaces, um, whether they're maybe just kind of quality artifacts lurking. Is your depressed group uh, producing lower quality images because they're moving in a scanner um, versus your healthy controls? And um, do these quote unquote more independently derived metrics not from FreeSurfer relate to FreeSurfer or some other um, similar morphometric outcomes? I had done uh, some stuff with VBM, but the, um, and we see some similar patterns, but FreeSurfer really was kind of this like interesting space since again, a lot of people in an applied world, for better or worse, basically throw their data into FreeSurfer, get the output out, and then they run some statistics on it. Um, I don't think that is a good way to proceed with science, but that is honestly what a lot of people are clearly doing because um, sometimes the data is bad, but FreeSurfer you know, goes burr and puts out some outcomes. Um, uh, filling in a little bit also of, of the Rosen paper, they look just at cortical thickness and Euler number, but could we start to think about surface area, which is another morphometric um, outcome that people look at, as well as gray matter volume. So just like subcortical volume that are output by free surfer, things like that. So getting into the kind of actual procedures of what we actually did, um, this is work um, led by two staff members in my group, Ali Gilmore and Nick uh, Busser. Um, we took data from the healthy uh, Healthy Brain Network from Child Mind and Mike Milham and colleagues um, is about 380 um, participants from some of the early waves. I think it was released one and two on a 3T scanner. Um, uh, we Child Mind Healthy Brain Network also has some one and a half T data, but we didn't look at that. Um, I didn't include stuff about um, uh, scanner sequence, but it was all on the same um, scanner that was at the uh, Rutgers Imaging Center. Um, I believe it was a GE3T. Um, 
And um, here's the demographics of the sample. It was predominantly um, or a little bit more male. This is a pediatric sample. They're about 10 years of age um, and overwhelmingly had clinical diagnoses. Um, fairly average cognitive ability and kind of standard BMI. Um, and what we did was we took a team of undergraduate raters, um, trained them on a kind of 10 point uh, rating scale and had them judge uh, all of these images, um, you know, based on these kind of anchoring points. Uh, we trained them on different kind of artifacts that were common to imaging and connected to motion, um, uh, kind of ghosting, ringing, things like that. Um, and then we used the CAT toolbox to start to get this, um, I would call it a scan grade, more on this in, in, in another slide. And then we actually ran FreeSurfer pulling out um, thickness, surface area, and volume. Um, and we started using BrainLife, which is this kind of cloud-based platform that Franco Pastilli and crew are, are um, put, uh, putting out um, at UT Austin and um, uh, Indiana University that uh, is basically just a free kind of cloud computing grid. Um, so if folks don't know about that, can say more about it, but Franco has been a great colleague and collaborator, and um, uh, it's, a, it's a nice way to just uh, be able to run a lot of data through different kinds of programs, uh, mainly diffusion stuff. But so uh, getting into this kind of um, quality toolbox, I see some things in the chat. Um, quick, sorry, I missed this early on. Um, there's some GPU powered free surfer. Yep, uh, totally know about that. And one could, again, use these things um, as quicker metrics. Uh, uh, but fast surfer, I think, is one of them. Um, but the big thing that I think a lot about is more in the applied space. So uh, folks who are thinking about, you know, who know what a GPU is, um, uh, are folks who have some computational sophistication. There's many applied research groups who uh, don't know anything about CNNs, deep learning, and kind of these GP, potentially GPU-powered shortcuts. Um, uh, and so, I think many groups may not have the technical sophistication um, and we need to, I think, be mindful of people using tools, applied researchers using tools um, and, you know, what is it with uh, great power comes great responsibility. Um, people, you know, still just putting data into FreeSurfer and getting things out. Um, in terms of, quick question about Euler numbers, is this um, from uh, MRI Euler number? Um, we consistently get Euler numbers of two for most scans. Um, yeah, so Euler number is, a, is variable in terms of its, it's a continuous metric. Um, and so if you're getting a pretty consistent number, it just might be that your scans are fairly similar in terms of quality. Um, uh, and you can also think about quality as an automated uh, program that folks um, have developed that, you know, takes FreeSurfer and then does um, some data science machine learning algorithms to predict um, usable, unusable scans. Um, uh, and uh, so, but Euler is a continuous number in the free surfer output. It's either in like the ASEG table a lot of times, but it's kind of, it'll just be called surface holes. Um, and that's a, the, the broad metric of Euler number that, you know, Rosen and crew have used. Um, and then, just, uh, yep. Sorry, a quick comment. Um, it's, I mean, I, it's not strictly continuous per se. I think it's basically you're trying to say is it's uh, proportional to the number of defects or yeah. holes that as you define, right? So, um, yeah. Um, and your, uh, Jerry, I think basically your question is, uh, my, my answer, I'm not the expert, Jamie is the expert here, is that, it is uh, basically um, predicting whether uh, quality is good enough for free surfer to actually produce a successful and accurate parcellation. That's I my hypothesis. My money would be on that, and it, which which is conveniently and helpfully actually also an indicator of quality. You know, if you have a good quality MRI, uh, no motion, no other artifacts, it will go through. Most of the time, if not every, that's what people want. I think that's the important point that Jamie is trying to uh, make. Yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of a good synopsis of things. Um, but FreeSurfer can still have some errors and some issues, and we have good quality scans that just uh, 
have errors in free cipher and there's you know sometimes regardless of almost how many times we restart and try to kind of uh, push that data forward, it, it just sometimes doesn't actually complete in free surfer. But the UN number is supposed to be this, I think, broad metric of, of success of surface uh, uh, generation. And then pretty if you had a, um, a note about healthy brain network having um, a, a lot of diagnostic uh, clinical issues, um, the sample is actually um, connected to a number of psychiatric um, uh, clinics in uh, New York. And so they actually scan, uh, basically, the story I've heard is they scan everyone who comes through the door. Um, and so basically, they try to get um, lots of families who are seeking treatment to also participate um, in imaging studies. And the, I think the broad idea is many times um, the samples we get in uh, imaging studies are wildly biased. The people who participate in research, uh, besides being weird in terms of Western educated industrialized research democracies um, tend to be, uh, you know, high, you know, incredibly highly educated and not at all reflective of the broad US population, even if we use just that sphere. Um, and there's been some nice work, um, Kaya Lewin at um, UC um, San Francisco has kind of talked about this idea of, you know, uh, the samples, especially the, the folks who have Good imaging data are, are, are biased. It's a biased sample just in general, and happy to send that kind of reference on to folks. Um, but, yeah. yep. Um, and uh, so, this um, doing some exploration about different morphometric tools, I at some point stumbled on this thing called CAT 12, um, which is the computational anatomy toolbox. Um, and this was um, an SBM toolbox developed by um, Christian Gasser um, at the University of Jena. And um, he was kind of, uh, Dr. Gasser has been a kind of VBM uh, proponent and kind of superstar on some level, done a lot of kind of nice work on optimized VBM, um, especially kind of in an, uh, an SBM space. I know it's MATLAB, I apologize for that. Um, but SB, uh, this uh, CAT, uh, computational anatomy toolbox version 12 um, completes lots of um, pre-processing and processing steps, um, as well as analysis for VBM, DBM, surface-based morphometry, lots of different things. Um, and the interesting thing on, on, my, on my side, um, because we were originally thinking about use of C, um, CAT 12 um, with these really large data sets that we didn't think we would have the computational power to complete FreeSurfer on, um, you know, we found that um, CAT-12 can do a lot of the kind of basics uh, of um, uh, structural imaging processing and kind of, I, I cut my teeth as a graduate student doing voxel-based and deformation-based morphometry. And so I thought this, is, this could be an easy way to kind of, um, you know, quickly process some data sets. Um, and CAT-12, um, interestingly, as I kind of explored it more, I found it output this single metric a single quality grade, it called it, um, for each T1 that combined uh, noise to contrast ratio, coefficient of, of joint variation, um, inho inhomogeneity to contrast ratio, uh, and root mean squared um, voxel resolution. And, and basically combine them using kind of a root mean square equation to just kind of combine them all. And the nice thing is if you reduce all the steps out of um, CAT-12, because CAT-12 can do lots of different kinds of uh, pre-processing, smoothing, stuff like that, if you just kind of cut down to the basics, um, it'll give you an estimate of uh, image quality in about 15 minutes or less. Um, 15 minutes on the kind of higher side for, you know, sub one millimeter voxel data, but, um, you know, sometimes eight, eight to 10 minutes. Um, it puts out a little kind of PDF, um, as well as this kind of just a numeric grade or a numeric value between zero and one or zero to, uh, zero to 100. Um, and um, what we basically then did was we took all the T1s, um, had individual raters, um, I'll talk about a little bit of that data in a second, and using um, the average of all those raters, we um, classified scans as to be included or to be excluded. And in parallel, we put all those same images into CAT-12 and got out this kind of quantitative metric um, of these multiple um, image quality um, forms. And so in terms of our 
radar data, our human uh, visual checks, um, we have data from about six radars and here's um, you know, density plots from all of our six radars shown in different colors um, and the values from this on this zero to 10 scale. Um, and we chose six as a cutoff for scan inclusion. Um, and that was kind of based on the mean as well as the median, as well as kind of examining um, the actual ratings that the individuals gave, uh, the Rosen paper and some other um, uh, past work on image quality to kind of start to bin um, through uh, where do we start to see ringing and, and different kinds of um, artifacts that might be impacting segmentation. Um, we can kind of come back to this because I think it's a really important thing is like where you draw the cutoff and line. And obviously we don't really have a gold standard, which I think has been um, a big point of discussion on some of the um, NIQC listservs of like, what, what is, where, where do we draw this line? But I was very struck by having these kind of two large kind of histogram, you know, distributions where it's basically there's probably a bunch of times where people are starting to say, this isn't usable and this is. Um, and, uh, uh, yep. Sorry, quick question, Jim. Sure. Uh, maybe I missed this. Um, where are the numbers coming from? You know, the um, rating numbers, is it like a single number they rate from zero to 10 or is it some of different items? Yep, it is. This right. is this is the individual um, ratings uh, and training that they were basically kind of shown um, on this kind of um, zero to 10 or one to 10 scale, where it's basically yeah. saying, Here's an exemplar, and they had a number of exemplar images oh, okay. um, that says, here's an example of a bad set of images, um, and here's a kind of particularly crystal clear. Um, and obviously, right. the stuff in the middle is the, is the tough part when you kind of, um, you know, say this is a particularly noisy subject, things like that. Um, right. in, in the paper, in the supplement, we go through uh, more incrementally to say, Here's an example of a two, a four, a mm -hmm. six, an eight, and a 10 to kind of give um, a bit more kind of context about um, where yeah. those ratings are. And so just those are kind of used as broad anchors. Um, and then we had repeats where um, there were repetitions of the same scans that kind of check for reliability and drift um, uh, as, as folks went on. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's the, yeah. Basically, I was curious if, I mean, basically, this way of rating would confound different types of sources of um, uh, corruption of quality, you know, for example, motion artifacts and whatnot, right? So they're not, um, I'm not criticizing the work. I'm just yeah. trying to, uh, um, yeah, um, this is another way of approaching it. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is this is very much, I think, an applied uh, version and towards an applied audience because I think you're right. You could really get down deeper and think about large kind of groups or classifications of artifacts. And so, like, you know, is there ghosting? What's the contrast like? Um, is there ringing in kind of the kind of more distal cortex? And can you start to see white matter branching kind of like getting fuzzier? Um, and you can almost think about developing um, a, a more rich kind of uh, set of measures that would try to rate every scan more deeply. Um, we ended up also using Enigma has a free surfer um, you know, kind of quality, like a QC kind of um, template and scoring system. And we did a little bit of that also. We did that on these same subjects, but we haven't kind of gone into that data. And that actually looks at where are there problematic areas. And so is reconstruction failing in, you know, the anterior medial temporal lobes. Um, you know, that's kind of a kind of common space of just like free surfer having lots of uh, issues or is the frontal pole just not kind of um, generating a solid surface that's kind of consistent. Um, yeah, but so yeah, definitely. I think there's more work and uh, a lot that could be done in this space of in terms of how you train a raider and thinking about divisions of potential artifacts. Um, but using this kind of more um, aggregated version of things, 
um, we lost about 46% of our participants, um, just kind of drawing um, a line at about a, at an average rating of six. And so we only were able to keep about 54% of our scans, that's about 209 participants. And then here's the distribution of the CAT 12 kind of weighted average. Um, so you can see there's some particularly noisy and, and just really bad scans that are getting um, scores of you know, 0.5. And then there's a kind of a good number of scans that are getting more in the high 80s. And so what we wanted to do is just think about this kind of quicker metric of image quality and whether it predicted scan inclusion as judged by the average uh, of human raters. So we constructed a logistic regression with um, scan inclusion, a binary 0, 01 for any human, average human ratings above 0. 0.6 and an IV of CAT, this CAT 12 grade. Um, and what we find is this, you know, 15 minute kind of CAT 12 output um, was it, it was a decent predictor of scan inclusion, um, you know, is a significant um, logistic model. And here are the kind of um, AUC curves um, with the confidence intervals, as well as um, we did 80% training and a 20% test set and did um, some confusion matrix uh, calculation. The paper has um, uh, the kind of deeper confusion matrix uh, outputs like kappa precision, stuff like that. But we thought that was pretty solid. Um, and I can think, uh, talk a little bit more in the discussion about use of this to start to sort, you know, particularly bad and particularly good scans, and then almost the definition of a gray, gray middle. Um, turning to the second question, um, uh, are these CAT-12 metrics related to kind of sociodemographic variables? And so we examine correlations with this CAT-12 grade, um, age, sex, BMI, IQ, clinical diagnosis. Um, replicating kind of similar stuff to Rosen and some other folks, we found that age, and again, this is a pediatric sample, so it, it, it stops right at about 18 to 20 years of age, only age was related to these CAT-12 image quality grades. Um, it's a decent correlation in our 300 people. Um, if you look at people who, um, interesting, if you just subset and just include people who raters uh, human raters just, you know, classified as, as a good quality passing visual QC scan, um, we still see this kind of continuous association. Um, this is in about the 209 participants that our human raters said were above our, our six threshold. So the correlation drops, but still the same, same deal with increasing age, you see better quality data. Um, and then so kind of the, the meat uh, of the whole paper was whether these independently derived metrics, not from FreeSurfer, related to FreeSurfer uh, outcomes. So what we did is we basically took these CAT-12 grades for only the included subjects, there's 209 of them, and we basically saw the, looked at the correlation for CAT-12 and um, uh, thickness, subcortical volume, surface area, um, from the um, DK atlas in um, FreeServer, which has about 68 um, parcellations, um, and the ASEG table, which has about 22 subcortical, correlate, uh, subcortical regions. And so looking across all of those, um, you know, 150 plus regions, um, what did we find? Uh, we find that about 23% of all the areas investigated had um, a significant um, association with quality. Um, and this is basically a bivariate correlation of one, you know, one IV regression with CAT-12 um, uh, as the IV and, and the free surfer output as the DV, surface area thickness or volume. Uh, of note, when I say 25%, um, this is a p-value of less than 05 FDR corrected within a metric. So basically we took the 68 cortical surface um, areas that were output by the DK Atlas, ran 68 regressions, then corrected all the p-values uh, of those regressions um, within just surface area or just cortical thickness or just subcortical volume. Uh, and then um, we define significance as this uh, p-value of uh, p05 for um, FDR corrected uh, association. So we see these kind of um, reasonably, uh, you know, strong bivariate correlations for about 24% of the, the regions in um, uh, these free surfer atlases. 
And to kind of get into that a little bit more deeply, um, when we look at surface area, um, this is um, the ggseg um, plots, but basically here's the uncorrected T statistics varying from about negative four and a half to positive four and a half on the uh, kind of um, gradient color bar. Um, and these are the raw T scores and then the regions that are highlighted in this kind of pinkish red um, survived multiple comparisons. And so for just surface area in relation to CAT 12, um, there was an average T-score, and, uh, and you know, think about that as a, as a broad metric of um, the relationship um, of about uh, 1.4. But interestingly, the T, um, the T um, statistics range from um, uh, just under negative one to uh, almost five. And um, for folks who aren't really as acquainted uh, about applied research, um, some of these differences are larger than the group differences statistically than we see in clinical work. So you may not get a t-value of 4.5 uh, when you compare depressed group and uh, non-depressed group. So I was, I was quite struck by this. And when we do all this kind of multiple comparison correction for the 68 regions in um, the DK Atlas, um, 12 of them are significant at this uh, P FDR corrected 05 level. And so this is for surface area. Pradeep, did you have a question? Yeah, sorry. Um, this is some kind of group differences. Is, is it like inclusion versus exclusion? So these are for just the scans that are included. So we start with 380. Um, we only look at participants who um, are raiders. No, so, yeah. But how are you getting the P statistic? Is, is so it, we, it's typical. The, the, it's the CAT 12 and the surface area. They're both just continuous variables. So it's just basically a correlation or one IV regression. Okay, I guess um, usually T statistics a statistic is computed from a difference somewhere. I'm just trying to see what that difference is, unless is I'm it, mistaken. I mean, it's a a T statistic is just a student T distribution. I would think that it's just the likelihood of a of a beta be you know an effect size being okay. larger. Um, yeah, so you can think, I can pull up the raw betas, um, but those are sometimes, you know, sizable betas uh, above 0.3. Some of the, I would yeah. say anything that's FDR corrected is a beta above 0.3 or co Cohen's, you know, Cohen's D. Um, yeah, or maybe that, I'm trying to ask the question that if the uh, correlation is significantly different from zero, you know, so yeah. I guess it's relative to no correlation. I guess that's yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. so it's just basically whether the the core, like whether the core, like whether the slope has whether there's a non significant slope basically of the correlation. Right. Um, so here we see about twelve regions that are related to um, surface area and image quality from CAT twelve, and then we see. Um, a slightly stronger pattern for cortical thickness. Um, the T range goes from about 2.3 all the way, negative 2.3 all the way up to about six. Um, and this in general is larger than most group differences I ever see in any published paper I've, I've, ever, I've ever, you know, been a part of. And about 23 of the 68 regions um, were um, uh, P less than 05 um, FDR corrected. Um, so you can think about the sizable numbers of regions that uh, cortical thickness is related purely to quality. Um, I should, and here's the last one, which is um, subcortical volume. Um, there's less, um, uh, smaller, slightly smaller effects here. Only two regions actually survive uh, multiple comparisons when we correct for the 22 comparisons that are in the, this is the kind of standard free surfer ASEG atlas. Um, but um, notably, one of them is actually the, the left amygdala, which um, is very kind of critical and a major focus of, of, of affective neuroscience and applied work. Uh, multiple groups are just comparing amygdala volume for depressed or anxious individuals versus healthy controls or individuals with criminal tendencies, psychopathy, stuff like that. Um, and um, so, 
starting to kind of like drill into things a little bit more, you know, we can start to think is, is cat 12 really just a really quick Euler number? Um, kind of not yes and no, they're, they're pretty strongly correlated. You can think about they're, they're sharing over 80% of the, their variance. Um, so Euler number is shown on the horizontal axis, cat 12 is on the vertical, and you know, it's a pretty strong correlation. And um, yeah, um, pretty, the, just a second. Yeah, go back. Uh, the uh, range for the Euler number is like zero to six hundred. Yeah. Wow. Um, that means there's some really bad scans with like almost six hundred holes. Yep. Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, I mean, you can you can think about, and this is true, and the reason that we actually use Healthy Brain Network. So these are. Um, this is for all participants, I should say. So I haven't, I haven't just limited it to the 200 that have usable scans above a rating of a six. Um, but lots of clinical work uses people with psychopathology and multiple clinical diagnoses. And that's what this sample has a lot of. And so, you know, there's probably, I would guess these people here, especially the folks that have particularly high, um, you know, Euler numbers, are probably the folks that have uh, multiple psychiatric diagnoses, potentially challenges with cognitive ability and impulsivity, things like that. Um, but we can think about all of the priorities of the NIMH. These are all the things that the NIMH wants to fund and wants applied researchers to figure out. Why do people uh, impulsively use drugs? Why are people depressed and anhedonic? Um, and the measures we're getting from an imaging scan uh, are confounded a bit or I would argue with some of the, the, the metrics uh, uh, of diagnosis and variables of actual interest. Um, so uh, moving past some of this work, um, we also just ran some um, logistic models with um, free surfer, Euler number, um, free surfer, Euler number, CAT12, and both variables to try to think about, can we start to get AUC metrics that start to bump uh, up anymore? You know, the AC was already kind of at ceiling, um, is it pretty high in terms of the confidence intervals are in the 99 percentile. Um, and you can kind of see that even if we zoom in on these curves, um, Euler number is shown in black, um, CAT 12 is shown in red, and both variables um, are shown in blue. And basically, what I did was construct three logistic models one with just Euler number, one with just CAT 12, and one with both variables. And can we predict the binary, you know, zero one of scan inclusion? And we really, you know, the performance is, is pretty similar. Um, in the paper, we do a couple, uh, we do a lot of things in the supplement where we look at um, controlling for age, you know, looking at all the scans, not just the ones that are seen as kind of visually, you know, passing a human rater check. Um, so definitely kind of check that out for more information. Um, and the last kind of bits of data I'll show is, um, we actually, you know, almost tried to say or think about, well, is, is CAT-12, you know, doing anything better than Euler number, this free surfer outcome? And, and so what we did was we ran these same analyses, um, except the regression model expanded to the dependent variable with some free surfer outcome, uh, surface area, cortical thickness, volume. And we now had two independent variables, um, either um, Euler number or CAT-12, um, uh, in just a kind of additive linear regression. And then we tried to basically pull the coefficients or the t-statistics off um, out of um, uh, for either CAT12 when you're basically controlling for Euler number or Euler number when you're controlling for CAT12. And so this is CAT12, the surface area volume or the surface area effects drop a little bit, perhaps not surprisingly because Euler number and CAT12 share a lot of variance. Um, so there's a few um, regions that still survive multiple comparisons, and the, basically the relationship between image quality as derived by CAT12 relates to um, uh, free surfer output, even when controlling for Euler number, so above and beyond that metric of quality. But interestingly, uh, you can kind of see weaker kind of uh, gradient here and gradient here, and, and no, no areas surviving multiple comparisons. Um, when we do the reverse contrast for just Euler number comparing for CAT12. So I thought that was kind of interesting because CAT12 might be buying us something unique or different. Um, and we can think about different ways that one might be optimizing 
the image quality metrics that go into these kinds of quote unquote grades. Um, did the same thing for cortical thickness. We actually see um, uh, both CAT12 and Euler number both predict um, variations in these cortical thickness metrics when controlling for um, the opposite quality metric. So either Euler, here's, here's Euler controlling for CAT12, here's CAT12 controlling for Euler. Um, it's a bit stronger sometimes for CAT12, but um, it's still both, I think, are picking up variations. And this is, again, in a two-variable two um, regression where you're basically controlling for the other metric of quality. So to kind of quickly wrap all this up, um, we found kind of this um, you know, really quick to complete measure of image quality was useful for scan inclusion decisions. Um, note that I kind of uh, try to be uh, somewhat precise in my kind of um, uh, uh, kind of wording, um, mainly so I don't get on Pradeep's kind of enemies list, um, where basically when I can think about these metrics in really large data sets um, where rating hundreds, if not thousands of scans may be un untenable, where we could start to say, you know, these scans are good and they're, you know, CAT 12 grades are above 0.85. And these scans are particularly bad. Their CAT 12 grades are below 0.7. And could we have a kind of gray area that we say, these are probably on the fence and this is where the confusion matrix and different things are gonna have errors. And can we start to say, let's go back and you know have a human uh, rater go through and say, include, exclude, or rate those um, that we could then use as a different point of information um, in our decisions about whether to include a scan or not. So that's kind of, I think, one useful thing. And again, this is all about kind of applied research. And you can think about ADNI, UK Biobank, the ABCD project, which is focused on adolescents, and how these samples are massive and we uh, may not have the person power to do the rigor of quality control that we can do at smaller samples, but we still, as we scale, need to think about and be mindful of still having quality control as much as we can. Um, interestingly, this CAT12 metric related to a lot of um, uh, free surfer outputs, 25% um, if you're correcting for multiple comparisons, 35% um, if you're not. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of uh, uh, variations in morphometrics that are just related to quality. And at a you know, larger 10,000 foot level, I kind of wonder about this kind of confounding bias potential kind of collider issue. We may have this problem of image quality is related to impulsivity. Um, image quality is also related to, clearly related to these brain volumes, uh, but impulsivity is re also related to brain volumes. And so we may be just having this difficulty in parsing apart different kinds of variants that might be related to our demographic and actual kind of phenotypes of interest. Um, put a different way, you may have a clinical group with low quality scans, lower quality scans, and a non-patient group, a healthy control group with higher quality scans. And in many ways, we may be control, you know, comparing apples versus oranges um, if we're not careful. Um, and really to, to kind of uh, make this as applied and, and slightly silly, but hopefully as meaningful as possible, I think a lot about structural imaging, you know, and people finding group differences, and you know, they're, they're not being much of a care given to any kind of um, comparison or thoughtfulness about whether those groups actually just differ on the quality of images they have. And so we may find structural images between differences between groups, but did people, besides this hard binary of include exclude, there's still probably a lot of continuous variance that's important in the include group that could be driving the between differences groups that you're that you think are important, but are actually related purely to image quality and not the broad phenotype of interest, because the phenotype of interest and image quality may be collinear in various forms. Um, last little bit of data, because I just want to pack some stuff in, is from BrainAge. Um, I talked about this, I think, right before the talk started, but um, BrainAge, people are really interested in this idea of your brain may look more advanced or more aged than your chronological age. Um, and so um, I used a commonly derived um, brain age metric from um, uh, a paper published in Nature Neuroscience by Kaufman and colleagues. Um, it is a, I think it's a gradient descent tree boosting algorithm, if, if memory serves. 
um, that derives the brain age. And so we just use their pre-trained models. Um, we used it on the NKA Rockland sample, which is about a thousand people. Uh, um, and um, we ran CAT12 on the same people. Um, so CAT12 is on the horizontal. Brain age difference, so the person's chronological age um, subtracted from their predicted brain age is shown on the vertical. Greater numbers indicate more advanced or aged brains. Um, and we see this negative, pretty reasonably strong correlation. This is in about a thousand people um, where, um, you know, more advanced or accelerated aged brains are actually just poor quality. One, I, I don't know if I'd say depressing, but concerning note is I've already thrown out all the bad quality, most of the bad quality scans here. This has a, this is the, the lowest bound of CAT-12 that I included was 0.8. Um, but CAT-12 varies all the way down to zero. Usually the really bad scans are about 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Um, but so this relationship is even stronger if you include really bad scans. So um, really kind of uh, pushes us to think about how to deal with this kind of bias, especially when you think about individuals who are older, maybe in a scanner, having different kinds of cognitive impairments, those people are more likely to probably move because it, it may be uncomfortable. It may be harder to exercise that kind of cognitive control you need to be still in, in a scanner. So last kind of bits to just wrap stuff up. Um, CAT-12, I, I, I kept kind of saying image quality. It's not necessarily motion, um, but lower quality, you know, could be arising from multiple sources. You know, think a lot about scanning bias and homogeneity, just kind of bad pulse sequence kind of stuff, scanner drift. But I'm going to bet that the largest you know, driver of that is probably movement. Um, we can kind of maybe argue about that if we like. Um, there's probably ways that we can start to use phantoms and then kind of isolate these things a little bit more. Um, but I'm going to bet that image quality variations are, are at least you know, the biggest source of it is going to be subject to movement. Um, Again, kind of quick limitation. Um, and this is me just being an applied researcher. I just kind of use these prefab tools that you know, put together all these image metrics. But um, you can think about there's lots of different metrics um, and the way that they're aggregating may be washing out meaningful variants. Individual metrics may actually give us um, additional ability to predict um, scans, free surfer outcomes that are kind of this collider issue, et cetera. You know, you could easily think about kind of MRI QCs, multiple metrics being kind of in some finalized regression um, or some kind of, you know, uh, machine learning model to kind of think about unique Prediction. I think like kind of Russ Polderak and the BIDS crew at Stanford are already kind of doing a lot of this, um, but we could think about aggregation of these many different kinds of image equality, uh, also including citizen science kind of metrics and trained raters um, to start to think about isolating unique sources of variance that may help us predict inclusion and uh, exclusion and just quality in general. And so with that, I'll kind of close and thank my lab and then uh, open things up if there's kind of specific questions that folks have. So with that, let's see what questions you guys have. David, Yarek, any questions, comments before I... Uh, oh, that was fabulous. Um, it reminds me of, oh, back in about uh, 1998, where someone wrote the paper that says all of fMRI is task correlated motion, i.e. <laughs> all of it was purely artifact. You turn on flashing lights, people jump. Well, fine, you get a signal change. You turn on you know, loud sounds. Well, fine, people jump and you get the signal change. Uh, so fine, that didn't end up quite, I mean, it's important, of course, you know, and then, um, then of course, just you know, more recently, uh, five or eight years ago, all of fMRI is, uh, you know, due to pr parametric versus non-parametric tests and the cluster failure, things like that, yeah. and everything yeah. is wrong. There's, you know, everything's riddled with uh, things. So, every once in a while, every few years, you know, the field goes through this everything is wrong type of phase. And thank you for introducing, you know, everything is nothing to do with the biology is completely. Uh, reasonable uh, oh, biology of, of uh, patient <laughs> compliance in the scanner so that, that I... and and, and I'm, I'm not trying to actually say that I just think that there may be there may be inflation of effect estimates 
that we should try to oh, meaningfully... Now you say that the whole talk. You never said that. Yeah. And, I, and I'm just having fun with the with the, with the yeah. statement. And I know I know what you mean. I think yeah. for the most part. But anyway, so I relish uh, that in some sense. So yeah, so that was not a complaint. That was just a okay. observation. Um, the other thing that struck me, I think it was the. I mean, just as a practical example. We have historically always known that the gray white contrast in the immediate neighborhood of the central uh, pre and post central gyri are a little bit different. It's just some anatomy, something that decreases that contrast, uh, which is why it jumped right out at me when you showed, you know, some of the regions mm -hmm. that cared an awful lot about image quality more so than others were regions that, you know, happened to be particularly sensitive, you know, a little lower, you know, intrinsic T1 contrast you know, in that zone. So that you know, kind of just popped out as, you know, sort of confirmation that, hey, image quality is hugely important to how you get the thickness of that, you know, in sort of a stable way and, you know, lower quality to, I could, I could see the mechanism, you know, why that would, would um, happen that way. So that, again, it just sort of made sense in that sense. Uh, I, mean, I have no other specific things to say other than that it's important that we do, you know, account for and covariate for this or balance, you know, studies, you know, on these types of factors or, you know, again, exactly what to do going forward is not completely clear to me, but I think it's an important uh, thing to keep in our mind and our bag of QC, QA uh, things. So thanks. It would, it would be interesting given that comment about contrast maps, it would be very, it would be lamentably in, in, incomplete and maybe imperfect, but potentially useful if we almost had a, you know, thinking about that last comment and the kind of pre-central, post-central virus, just having an average image contrast map that we could almost start to kind of uh, use or put into some of our parts. I forget how much FreeSurfer builds into any of that um, and whether we could start to almost just, you know, start to try to attenuate these issues with contrast that might be present that we're just kind of, you know, glossing over. Um, again, it wouldn't be perfect, but if we had some kind of prior to at least say, let's up or down weight, you know, this, th what's happening here because of this kind of very known and probably aggregated image contrast effect. That could be something that we think about as we move through QC processes. Yeah. Yeah. And again, so, I don't know the details of the free surfer that I know they have, do, have some priors based on that, but I don't yeah. know if that specifically is in there, but yeah. I've, I've like yeah. harangued, I've harangued Bruce Fischel over the years about various things. So I, I don't want to get on any, yeah. any, any more bad lists that I'm sure I'm, I was the amygdala like segmentation curmudgeon for a while so i'll try not to be the, be the general image quality curmudgeon now but yeah so jimmy um i put a link to one of my preprints uh, basically what we did was to rate free for quality uh using visual qc uh, that you guys have mm -hmm. may, have may have seen and from the rating process we have individual roi wise error statistics in the sense, mm, yep. how frequently partic uh, a particular ROI was erroneous, right? So your uh, talk made me think, um, basically the relationship between the CAT 12 quality score, uh, the association, the significant association you see that uh, survived the uh, correction is probably indicating the difficulty of segmenting that particular Y in a way. Yeah. It may be or maybe not, but I, I, I was thinking because we know that, for example, hippocampus or amygdala, so to say, are particularly challenging to automatically segment, right? So if you have a much better quality image, the challenge goes down a little bit in that still challenging space. So uh, relating that to the error statistics we have from uh, manual, what you call rating of whether uh, free software errors were in a particular Y may be interesting. And um, the CNR thing, I think we could compute ROI wise uh, tissue contrast, right? And that could be related to these uh, ROI error statistics also in a way, so to say, you know, if you can find a metric within an ROI to say, hey, you know what, this ROI is likely to be segmented inaccurately. And um, 
uh, that's i think also useful besides basically the overall quality metric you're talking about and i absolutely love this talk especially the conclusion you put out saying hey the meme just is perfect spot on you know you ensure different groups you are comparing have similar levels of quality i think that's a really fundamental insight and an important one actually uh, that we should uh, raise people awareness of so having a quality metric and then ensuring that whatever people are analyzing have similar levels of quality of course one can argue you know if you have a threshold of for minimum quality what's the point of having that but um, i think there is a few more interesting questions to be had um, this was fascinating jamie thank you i i actually learned a lot <laughs> uh, great i'm ha i'm happy it was was useful i also put in the chat there's this paper called sample composition alters associations between brain age and structure by Kyle Lewin and Margaret Sheridan and colleagues. Um, and it, it just really underscores, and I go back a lot to, um, if you look at other disciplines, epidemiology especially, uh, and just population sciences, they do a really good job of like stratifying a sample, making sure it's really reflective of like yeah. what, the, what the actual phenomenon is. But we, we struggle a lot with that in, in neuroimaging and neurobiological work. Um, and then yeah. when you start to say, oh, we need to match the subjects on image quality, you know, it, it may, may not even be possible. I again think about people who have maybe cognitive uh, impairments or challenges um, with impulsivity and kind of different kinds of control. I could only imagine if I was a person, a nonverbal person with autism, you know, being in a 120 decibel small tube is, real, <laughs> is not something that I want to yeah. do, number yeah. one. And if I have to do it, I that's going to be taxing a lot of my resources. And so yeah. you're, you're, if you, you know, if, I think we have to be careful not to swing the other way where it's like, okay, we're only going to get this clinical population with, you know, very high quality data. It's like, well, those people may actually be like aberrant in terms of, and not representative of the actual broad distribution of the clinical population you, you're interested in. And so I've been trying to think a lot about, could we do training and test sets where we almost yeah. like try to extract out, uh, use covariates and use that covariate weighting and apply it to the test set so that at least like if we can see these same patterns in the training and we're like controlling for image uh, quality in the training set, at least there's some application on the test set to kind of try to reduce this bias. Because at present, it just feels like a wildly lurking third variable where just like, geez, like, what yeah. what are are we just finding image quality basically are we, and you know I, I i felt bad yeah i was david thought i was throwing image under the bus and it's like no i, I actually want to just find more replicable yeah. and common patterns so yeah. yeah in fact actually uh, uh yarik also gave a talk early on um maybe you can talk more about it in terms of uh uh noise outside the phantom regions of uh, being useful in analysis. Uh, Eric, you wanna elaborate more? I think both are related here. Well, that was just a hypothesis, I think, right? I, I, I didn't really show any analysis over that, right? What we showed that data on a different scan on the phantom, right? Could actually explain possibly some results in human subject data acquired around the same time point, right? But hypothesis was that indeed maybe data outside of the brain then could be taken as you know some characteristic measure of quality of the scan at that point. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I, I think that's just so interesting because you can think about we may be only doing phantoms at, at kind of random intervals, and some of these studies go to great lengths to get phantoms and to do multiple runs. But the scanner may still drift over time and you're still having these biases just creep in. And yeah, and so if there was a way to have almost a, something standardized that could be put in with every scanner or region of just, you know, of the case space of the imaging matrix that could be used as just a, a marker of where the, you know, the, the pulse sequence and the gradients are to potentially then kind of, you know, apply some kind of correction across. 
um, it feels like, especially like people may have lots of feelings about deep learning and it being too, too magical, but there could be ways that we could think about some, some deep learning models that are trained uh, with these kinds of different data sets that could then almost try to correct um, or at least, you know, attenuate some of this bias. So yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, there is some work on perspective motion detection slash correction in case space. Yep, yep. So there uh, it's happening in a way, but there is a lot more could be done, you know? So um, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I also think about, again, folks I think referenced earlier in the call, like, oh, you could use these GPU free surfer thing, you know, fast surfer stuff. Um, yeah. There are many groups who do not have the technical capacities. And yeah, no, I was not saying oh, yeah, that yeah. Uh, free surfer is good enough, you know? In well, fact, I, yeah, yeah, but I, I, I did, like the core. Yeah, I just, I just think a lot about, there are lots of people who are plugging and playing and picking up these tools. And the more that we can make tools that are reasonable for the applied researcher who may not, you know, their specialty is in psychiatric, you know, yeah. mechanisms of disease. Uh, yeah. And that, that's going to be the thing that they know. And they're not going to know gray white contrast or, you know, case space or yeah. anything else. And if the yeah. more that we can make these tools like at least somewhat accessible, the bids, uh, you know, initiatives, I think, are, are doing that a bit. But, you know, the yeah. more we can make it so that applied folks may be at least mindful and trying to correct for these biases, I think, is a, is a good general, yeah. you know, idea for this group. And I'm excited to see. And connect more with it. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, great. Any comments, Yarik? Uh, questions for? I, I just kept staring at that figure four. It was also in the slide, but um, looking at the figure four in the paper, I don't know if I would be able to share the screen. Uh, but if you allow me, and hopefully I don't show too much of what is not relevant. But you see this one, right? Yeah. Um, so obviously, and that's what it shows, right? That's what it claims. So I'm not disproving the figure that there is age effect, right? So uh, as people mature, right? We, the quality grows, right? But I keep staring at the, that it feels like there are groups. First of all, the, the, the population wasn't totally balanced, right? So there is more of age group five to, what is it? Like 13, yeah. right? And then, you know, their brain kicks in and they stop moving and, you know, they, they, they kind of generally good subjects. But if you were to take 5 to 12, would that figure tell the same story? Because I, from looking at the cloud, and thank you, by the way, for scatterplot. I love scatterplot <laughs> because mm -hmm. then you could ask the questions. If you just showed the line, you know, that's it. I had no question, right? But if you look at 5 to 12, right? So it's before they go into this maturation phase of becoming somewhat human. Uh, would you see the same, right? Let's say you, even if you just plot it per arbitrary bin, let's say per you know year, the same mean and standard error around the point, right? Would it look flat here? So maybe age doesn't matter as per se, but maybe the uh, age yeah, group matters, a, right? It's super interesting question. And I feel like there's, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a super interesting question. And uh, there's lots of interest. There's a lot to, I think, unpack there. Because you could also think about the quality may be driven by just regional contrast that starts to be a developmental process. Like the brain looks less like a squishy bowl of jello at points. Uh, and you get stronger gray white contrast uh, over time. Uh, and another thing I always think about is sometimes we use the, the, uh, the MRI as this, like we try to pretend or act like it is this very precise, you know, rich thing, but sometimes the, um, the, 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 the simplest and almost like I would say stupidest metrics from MRI can be wildly yeah. predictive of useful phenotypes we try to make all this like, oh, brain structure is doing this and this is impulsivity. It's like, okay, who completes a scan? Who doesn't? Who has more movement? 
And it's like, yeah. I, I don't even need a scanner. I just kind of need yeah. a mock scanner and I could like take the frame wise displacement of you moving during yeah. a movie or something. That's like 10 bucks versus like $700 <laughs> for a scan. And I could probably predict almost as much variance. And that worries me sometimes. But yeah, um, I definitely think there's subgroups. And I think we could you could probably think about, you could probably start to overlay phenotypes on top of it. And in my world, we talk about a lot of like latent, latent trade or latent, you know, growth curve modeling and just latent yeah. groups that are there. And so can yeah. we start to, we could take a bunch of personality measures or impulsivity or neurocognitive yeah. measures and start to say, are there kids that, you know, they have greater impulsivity, greater anxiety also, because maybe yeah. just being in a scanner movement may come from many directions. And can we start to almost say like, have a profile of, you know, you should be, you're in this group, you're in this group, you're in this group. And I, yeah, there's definitely massive heterogeneity. And I think one could really start to boil it down. Uh, and the only other thing I would say is you see the, you see this kind of hump uh, with age and quality where you get into like, I think the sixties or and seventies and you start to, the correlation flips the other way um, mm -hmm. where uh, not surprisingly el older participants start to move more. And Rosen has a nice plot where they like, you know, it's like zero to 20 or, you know, five to 20, they find a positive association, greater age, greater quality, but then, you know, about, about 60 on, um, they find uh, greater age is lower quality. So it's this interesting kind of, lots of developmental questions there too. So, yeah. That and another question I started to, actually, I, I just about went into HBM data, but didn't get far yet. One of the findings we found on Phantom that SAR indicator actually provides, which is what magnet estimates for you based on, you know, everything, right? Uh, weight and, uh, but also Phantom is the same and the same weight and the same, you know, everything besides, you know, what other extrinsic factors, right? And that SAR and Phantom provided the most explanatory power for signal to noise ratio of, on the phantom data, right? Mm. So I wondered how those metrics relate to, let's say, SAR, right? Which if it was captured, it's right there in metadata a bit. If not, then maybe it needs more digging, right? So, but then it would be how scanner parameters, which are not, you know, what we said, but what scanner decides affect our quality of scans, right? So what is that quality we are seeing? Is that really true quality of data is per se, like that's the variance or just if we scan that individual and it took some other parameters for shaming and whatnot, yeah. how far that would be, right? Yeah. You know, I, I remember when I used to scan a lot of kids and we had just switched over to like an eight channel coil. This is, you know, decades ago at this point, but like, if you were like a little bit out of the scan, like if you were a little bit out of the coil or, or like you weren't totally like in the, in, in the bucket, basically like your cerebellum, like you could just like see this like crazy gradient where you'd kind of be like, okay, cool. The image looks reasonable. And then it would just be like a literally like giant flip where you're like, oh, that is not good. And um, I think about those like small things that are, you know, we would never consider, but it's like, you know, the person prescribing the scan, how you situate somebody in there, if they move and they're like kind of slowly getting further down the scanner um, out, of the, out of the coil, you start to have all these kinds of crazy things that are just like idiosyncratic. But again, like I couldn't get a good cerebellar segmentation if I like, if my life depended on it with that, with those like people who had creeped out of the, you know, head coil a little bit. And it's just like, whoa, what do you do? What do you do with that? And those are just so far away from actual phenotypes uh, of like behavioral phenotypes of interest. So it's definitely very interesting stuff. Yeah, and for that, exactly the same thing happened to us with the Phantom, right? Because EOPD, what is it? Uh, position and scanner DICOM, something like that, which is yeah. present in the DICOM, right? It also provides explanatory power for SNR, obviously, right? As you confirm, you move it out of the scanner, you know, but even within the field of view, right? It just provides maybe minute, but still effects, right? So yeah. more consistent positioning, right? Like you took the subject out, you better place subject exactly at the same spot, right? If 
And even then, there is no guarantee that it would help, right? But that information itself is also valuable, right? Yeah, and that and that again, again, I think about these like small things, like just your ability to position and reposition and kind of get a really kind of good kind of uh, position in the scan can can vary by clinical groups and these other like you know if you're working with someone who's nonverbal or has lower cognitive abilities, you know, getting them to move in this exact way that you want them in a confined space that's kind of anxiety provoking. Yeah, harder, just harder to do than someone who is like, you know, I, I've had 50 or more MRIs in my life. Like I can like put me in there and I'm good, but, and you move me around all you want and I'm totally comfortable with it versus a totally, you know, environment naive, context naive participant. That's, yeah. you know, it's, it's crazy. So it, it'd be nice to think about again, ways that we could put things or use this kind of other you know it, things in the field of view for a given image to start to you know correct or at least deal with these even if they're minute just tiny bits of bias where you could say oh you know let's have this like clearly what should be in you know just a black space in the scan but we can kind of get a sense of where it is how how far the image is from the kind of you know the actual like edges stuff like that where you're like okay cool let's like start to correct this um, in a way that could be meaningful but that brings a point let's say if, if 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 there is these two different groups and we assume that they're scanned on the same scanner right it might be likely that different arrays attend to different groups right because of the questionnaire expertise like you need maybe psych more with psychiatry you know background to and then you have confound of operator right <laughs> which is also not there so we just need to take humans more out of the equation, right? So if we could somehow out of position, right, in the scanner, so it will not be up to operator to put this field of view, so it's AC yeah. to PC, right, or whatever, but it just click the button and it does the optimal. And I think some magnets already even do that, right? So you could also create fiducial, like, so it will align the same brain as it was aligned before or something like that. I haven't scanned for so long, I didn't remember. Uh, but again, taking the human away, right, and collecting enough information for kind of so later interrogation could be done might be indeed again just complete change of diagnosis. <laughs> yeah, and you know there was some paper um, ten years ago on um, basically level of hydration for the uh, patient being scanned actually make it makes a difference in uh, basically morphometric data you know mm. because uh, brains can uh, uh, it's not brains as in uh, some structures can uh, shrink and enlarge and whatnot right so i this came to me basically i think multiple things that we are discussing here are like non imaging metadata so to say being related to imaging metrics, right? Uh, so the demographics that we talked about, they're, they're all non-imaging data, right? And uh, you know, the, the point that Eric showed here in figure four is actually also a very interesting one that is worth digging further in a way, you know? And uh, there's also like, yeah, um, yeah, but also it's not... like at, just at this point in the history, right? So we are saying, oh, we need more subjects because we need more power, right? And again, all this explanatory power, that's one thing. But also we need more subjects because effects become smaller and smaller, right? So we're yeah. looking for some particular mm -hmm. difference, right? And then those all confounds, right, which are not disclosed, they become just more possibly relevant right and we yeah. indeed need to get rid of noise and also provide explanation for the effects which might kind of kill the effect right yeah which yeah, we didn't I mean, have to do 20 years ago whenever it was like you know they <laughs> moved the hand or they didn't move the hand right <laughs> yeah 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 i mean uh oh, sorry i lost my train of thought again time of the effects yeah you know so motion could be a there, there may be a time of the effects in motion, especially in children, you know, depending on the scan time, maybe they're more compliant or fresh in the morning, not so much when they're hungry or whatnot, you know, in the afternoon, you know? 
So I don't know. There's a lot of other confounding factors that are not even measured or even looked at, so to say. Yeah. Um... I'm, I'm mindful of time. I should jump it, off it, for a yeah, second. Yeah. But, but I was, I was going to say it goes back a little bit to ideas of like deep versus wide phenotyping in my, or deep versus wide sampling. Yeah. You know, in many ways, we're like, we need more data. We need more data. We need more data. And we always think about that just means more subjects. But I've been yeah. very struck related to, you know, some of Pradeep's, some of your last comments, Pradeep, uh, about like the Russ Poldrack, my connectome piece, and obviously yeah. functional data, a whole other thing to, Lots of challenges and compounds there, but uh, I'm always struck by I forget if it's like a Nature Communications paper where like you know Russ is like had more caffeine, had less sleep, and he kind of shows yeah. his networks mm -hmm. you know reorganizing yeah. in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And I think about like the Midnight Scan Club and like Dosenbach yeah. and crew at at, at at Wash U, and it's like you know th there could be something we need large we need more and more people as we get as we don't attend to this noise and if we at least did a better job of you know trying to think about the sources of variability in a small sample of people we may actually that sample growth may not need to be so exponential and i think about like this yeah. Diana green and like these functional yeah. kind of network maps that have a lot of variability person to person yeah. and yet we yeah. just kind of were like yeah cool we put them all to m and i and we're we're good uh, mm -hmm. and there's just so many sources of if we actually started to chunk away and just correct or at least try to control for some of these sources of noise across structural and functional volumes, we may be able to improve the effect size estimates um, and some of our statistics and what we find, um, both in terms of being more reliable, but also maybe being stronger associations because you've just pulled variance out of you know your statistical estimates that were just yeah. kind of variance, variance of just noise. So yeah. 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 Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah. Let's um, keep it going over Twitter or the Google group and whatnot. Um, I'll post the video uh, soon. Thank Perfect. you so much. Excited to Derek, you were going to say something? Okay. <laughs> no Bye, everybody. Bye.